to the audience who's just seen the film with this challenge, that the only wrong question is the unasked question. So we invite you to ask your questions uh, and get the ball rolling and make the most of the time that we have together. And really, there is no such thing as a wrong question on these issues. No, of course, that's it problem. also doesn't have to be a question. It's not a response. Yeah, maybe a comment. Yeah. yeah. What did you make of it? I was, I, I, we had a hand up. Wait, I'm sorry. No, you go ahead. I'll see you, Christopher. Raise your hand. I found it interesting when they were talking to the panelists, saying that, well, we've heard uh, the journalists are saying that Quebec is racist, and the woman said, well, we're no more racist than anyone else. Have you found in your own experience that religious accommodation is more prevalent in the rest of Canada and not so much in Quebec, or is the same situation prevalent in all of Canada? Um, no, the issues are pan-Canadian. Um, how many of you have seen another documentary that deals with similar issues right here in Alberta, in a, in a town southwest of uh, Calgary, a cattle, a cattle town called Brooks. Have, ever, have any of you ever seen the recent documentary, Brooks, the City of a Hundred Hellos? I highly recommend seeing it. It is almost a mirror image in English, in Alberta, of exactly what you've seen there. Because XL Meatpacking is the largest Canadian-owned meatpacking company in all of Canada, and they could not get labor. Well, there are people in the developing world who are ready, willing, and waiting to work for $14 an hour. For them, this is like becoming millionaires. And so they have been coming from Africa, they've been coming from the Middle East, they've been coming from Asia, and this was a town it was white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. And all of a sudden, now they have a mosque, they have, they, have, they have people from China, the Philippines, the Middle East, Sikhs. And this happened in the course of a decade, over a 10-year period. So this was exponential demographic. It was a makeover of this cattle country, little town, and it's a fascinating, and it's, it really is a mirror image of what we've just seen. They're dealing with the same issues. This is not germane just to Quebec. This is Canada. The issue of pluralism is a huge issue in liberal democratic societies, no matter where we find them in our day. No question about that. But there is distinct contexts. Alberta has been the most pluralistic part of Canada until yesterday. Because it was founded, it was founded through intense immigration over a very short period of time, over a hundred years. So we have the first peoples who've been here for 10,000 years or so. But the large settlement population was extremely diverse from the beginning. That's not true in Quebec. In Quebec, you had an immigration which goes back much longer or much farther, but you also have the accumulation of common experience, a common religious life, uh, until, until recently. So the context is very different in Quebec. So I'm struck, for example, in Quebec, by the reaction to the veil, which we've had none of in Western Canada. I mean, there's incidental reactions, but not at the level it was in Quebec, which seemed to me to be very much a contextual issue, a reaction to nuns who taught the older generation for years. So they're reading on to Muslims uh, a memory from within their own society. That's a crucial point. And it's, a, it's, it's very different than, I mean, people will read memories onto, onto various people in this part of the world too. But there isn't the same kind of historical legacy and, 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 in some sense, coherence. So I think there is that contextual difference, although the issue of pluralism, I think, is just ubiquitous in liberal democratic societies. What do you think? As a director, um, <laughs> and uh, uh, someone who is more of a political philosopher than a religious uh, scholar, like, 
miss you, but to fail to use the letter. Um, um, I'd also um, add that the difference with Quebec and France, for instance, as opposed to mm -hmm. you might find even in England and in uh, English Canada, is that for a very long time there was a religious state. Of course. And so the notion of secularism is one that is mostly unfamiliar to most of the other religions because it's not really discussed. There has never really been uh, a tradition of having a, an official religion and a role for religious orders uh, in Alberta or, or in, uh, in other Canadian provinces, even though uh, people like uh, Manning and Eberhard were uh, deeply religious, deeply religiously committed uh, uh, men, um, they still did not bring that aspect of the police into their premiership, which was not the case in Quebec until the 1960s. Um, and you also have a uh, uh, um, uh, population in Quebec, as in France, that uh, traditionally um, is, uh, in, uh, as a majority, uh, Catholic. Um, and so you have an overarching, uh, overarching institution within the church, um, which um, served to unite the population in general, um, as opposed to a kind of understanding religion that is most related to the private sphere, um, with um, a kind of religious pluralism, uh, as we have uh, out west, that is um, more conducive, perhaps, to, um, to to viewing religion as a private matter rather than this one, because it's not shared in the same matter. So I think it's such an important point because of the issue of secular secularization is recent in Quebec. I often say, I don't know how you respond to this, but I often say that the French Revolution never arrived in Quebec until 1960. So it's very late part of the story. The other thing though I wonder about Jerome, and, and, and you, uh, Professor Cornell, as well, uh, my sense is that Catholicism in Quebec also was quite distinct. That is, uh, whole notions of Jansenism hung on in Quebec much, much longer, long after they were really banished, at least officially, from the Catholic world in Italy and France and what have you. And then also, since it was very much uh, a, a kind of, I don't know if it's fair to say, pre-modern notion of the, of the, the relationship between between uh, church and state within a Catholic framework in Quebec. Uh, but that hung on much longer. I mean, in Quebec it was there until, until the Quiet Revolution, really. So those are also these large parts, these large contextual issues that are so interesting in, in, light, of, in light of pluralism. And just to give you a sense, the Quiet Revolution, folks, happens in the 1960s. Until that period, everything that pertained to health Medicare, uh, education, and welfare was totally taken care of by the Roman Catholic Church. Incidentally, they never ran in a deficit, ever. Because they had cheap slave labor. All the nuns and the priests worked for next to nothing. That's, Slaves of God. <laughs> <laughs> that said, one person has asked three professors a question, very dangerous, if we want to get them out. <laughs> If we want to get the balance, that gentleman had his hand up, and we didn't get to your question. Um, uh, I'll actually ask my question in a bit, I think. I think I'll let people comment on what you guys have to say. Mr. Wetland, did you have a question? Uh, not right at the second. Oh, okay. Cool. No. Mr. LeBlanc. I, yeah, I just I wanted to comment on what you've been discussing about the context in Quebec, because I, I grew up in that very uh, severe Catholic mm -hmm. culture. Um, I grew up here in the 1940s and 50s in Quebec. And they were, nuns and priests walked the streets of Montreal in their soutans and their habits. Mm -hmm. We had Corpus Christi processions <coughs> down in the middle of the street. Um, we were used to seeing people climbing up the steps of 
And so I, I guess I belong in part to the generation you're talking about. That, and, and I can, I, I never actually thought of it that way until watching the film and listening to you speak about it, about the reaction to that. That there probably is an underlying fear of a new religious state being imposed on the people, having lived through that and liberated themselves from it. I, can, I, I didn't have much sympathy for Eruville and the, that whole set of opinions until I watched the film, and now I can understand a little better where they're coming from, and also from what you've been talking about. It, it makes a lot more sense to me. We should maybe raise an issue of, of the Sharia court idea. Just as a matter of clarification, uh, the notion of Sharia law, there are a number of systems of Sharia law in Islam, and uh, the whole uh, normal proposal in the Canadian context, in the context of England, France, and what have you, is that those traditional, so-called traditional legal systems, would have, would have some legitimacy within the Canadian legal system. Now, that has, uh, we have parallel examples. Uh, one, one example, most recent one, and I think this is why this issue has been raised, would be uh, First People's Sentencing Circles. Yeah. That has status within the Canadian context. So that's an example of this kind of culturally based, community based system of law, which, which is defined and, and confined to the very particular kinds of issues. In the case of Sharia, they wanted it to have to do largely simply with family issues. We have two other examples which are long standing in Canada. One is the Roman Catholic tribunal associated with divorce. That is a Sharia court, uh, which has some standing within the Canadian legal system. And then the, the third one, of course, is within the Jewish community, it's the Dim Torah, uh, the calling together of several rabbis around. Uh, Again, a family issue. So those issues exist. If I can just make one point about them and then come to your question. The fact that you say, or that we said in, your, in the case of Ontario, that the Sharia court would have no standing, that the state refused to, to give it any standing, does not mean that the Sharia court disappears. The Dim Torah doesn't disappear, the Catholic Tribunal doesn't disappear, nor does the Sharia court disappear. It just means it has no standing, which means the state has no eyes on it. Please. With the courts that you just talked about <clears throat> that are in place in Canada, which has the final authority? Does the Canadian the civil court does? The civil court does? Yeah. Okay. If there is some kind of conflict that develops. Okay. That, sorry, yeah, that. Uh, raises another thought in my mind, actually, this uh, question of the Sharia law. Um, there was an informal Sharia Catholic law which existed in Quebec, and which I can again understand as playing a part in this. For example, when, when I was growing up there, we were forbidden by the uh, then Archbishop of Montreal, Cardinal Ligi, we were forbidden to have dances in church halls. That was a law that we had to observe. You were only allowed to have bingos in? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, bingos, no problem. <laughs> but, uh, but there were a lot of those things that we thought of as traditions, but really they were moral codes of conduct like like the Muslims are now talking about in their own religion. They're codes of conduct that they have. And we had them too. In, but they were accepted because it was in a pan-Christian kind of context at that time. But, but this brings up a bit, uh, something that Professor Go and I talked about last Monday. And it, um, I'll throw out to you uh, a paradigm here. Um, because Catholicism has evolved a lot since then. 
Um, the Quebec that you knew uh, no longer exists. Oh, I know. <laughs> not, not you. In fact, it swung to become one of the most open, secular societies. It has the highest rate of people living together who are not married. It has the highest rate of children born outside of marriage. Um, it also has, in the developed word, uh, world, a very high rate of suicide. And the fewest people going to church. Yeah. yeah well, the, the, the churches are, like, on a Sunday, empty. But <coughs> Catholicism has evolved. It's changed. What? And I would propose uh, here that we think about what Paul Tillich, a theologian, uh, German-born, uh, but who then came to the States in the rise of Nazism, and who, who as I learned, uh, Professor Goa actually studied with. Well, in 1948, he wrote a very interesting monograph entitled Theology of Culture. And in that uh, book, which I recommend, he lays down what philosophers, philosophers would call his first principle of the relationship between religion and culture. In fact, he states that religion is the substance of culture. And culture is the form of religion. And I, inc I invite you to think about that, this dynamic relationship between religion and culture in Canada. Because both religion and culture, are they're not static. Because they reflect the human condition, the collective human condition, they evolve, they morph, they develop, they change, and that's part of their organic nature. And so what we're really seeing in Canada, whether it be in Brooks, Alberta, or whether it be in Quebec, as we've seen with the Bouchard-Taylor Commission, is something quite interesting. In cultural studies, they refer to this as cultural hybridity. And Canada is a, is a huge laboratory of cultural hybridity. You're seeing these cultures coming together, organically informing one another, and before our eyes, whether it be this, the town of Brooks, Alberta, or other parts of Canada, we're seeing this evolution, this development, this growth, and this intermingling, this hybridity of cultures and religions. In fact, uh, the co-commissioner of the Bouchard-Taylor Commission, Gérard Bouchard, has just published a book. And he says multiculturalism, that model doesn't work anymore. That was essentially saying, if this was one of your native sons, Nespa. Um, the, 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 the watchword was that Canada is multicultural. And we go back to the Trudeau era and the whole idea that Canada, unlike the United States, Canada's not a melting pot. It's a mosaic. But it was like having these isolated pockets of culture that made a tapestry out of Canada. What Bouchard is proposing is that that does not reflect the reality of Canada today. Canada today are all these cultures in dialogue with one another. In fact, he's saying the real model that we need, it's a paradigm shift, is interculturalism. No longer multiculturalism, these isolated pockets, but interculturalism. That's what he's proposed in his book. And I, I think that is a, a provocative paradigm that he's, that he's proposing to us here. Um, what did your native son when he was Prime Minister said, James, um, uh, Joe Clark. How did he define Canada? Canada is a community of communities. Of, of, quite interesting when you think about that. Well, what's happened is these communities, I, I like the model because I work with musicians. You know, we speak in music of polyphony, of many voices. And what I propose, ladies and gentlemen, is that we're looking at a polyphonic society. 
Hugh McClellan, before we used to think in terms of two solitudes, English Canada and French Canada. That, but that model doesn't apply anymore. Now we have a multiplicity of voices, and they're informing and inflecting one another. So then let me raise a question. We take Tillich's, your, your notion of polyphony, and Tillich's lovely way of setting this up. I ask you, what is the religion of Quebec? Well, I think I'm a resident it's... Quebec scholar. Needs to respond to that. How, how, how do you see the religious dimension of Quebec and the form that takes within the society? Let me just provide a little footnote. If we uh, look at the Supreme Court case, the more recent Supreme Court case, which deals with this issue, sometimes referred to as the Drummond, the Drummondville education case, which uh, was before the Supreme Court here uh, uh, six, eight months ago, where parents from Drummondville in Quebec uh, argued that they should not, that they should be free to remove their children from the required course that the state of Quebec has insists be given in all schools on religion and ethics. Mm -hmm. That they should be free to remove their children from that. So part of the argument, one of the arguments that was made there, is that Quebec does have a religion. It's a kind of virulent secularism. Mm -hmm. And so that would be part of the polyphony. That would be part of what where we, we see Tillich. So then you're looking really not at secularism or a particular kind of secularism versus religious positions, but you're putting them all back together again. You're saying they're all kind of sharing that. How do you, how do you see that, Jerome? You put it on a spot then. As the one who has either studied with us or read those, <laughs> um, although I am familiar with you know, the name. Uh, he was in French in the yes. Dominican bookstore in over the mountain in Quebec. I'm also yes. charmed to see him there. I'm very aware of his influence. <laughs> yeah. um, I see that we have to be careful about seeing religion in terms of, of organized religion. Um, and I don't think, given what I know that that's not what he means um, in this case here. Um, I think there are religious realities that, that go beyond what we receive from organized religion. Um, uh, things that we sometimes call spirituality or philosophy, um, and they are, uh, in fact, both deeply personal and, and also inherited from from larger communities. And so, I think if you're going to ask me what the religion of Quebec is, they could either say that, or um, that it, it might not be the right question to ask. Um, I, you can ask, what is the relationship of uh, of Quebecers to religion, which is something we had talked about mm. before. But I think that the the question here that is in the background of this of this film and in the background of our discussion is which religion are we talking about, and what what specifically do we mean by by religion? Well, my, my there wasn't there wasn't much of a debate around uh, religious issues, not to the, to the degree that we've had with multiculturalism and interculturalism and all the misunderstandings with that Michelle has about uh, multiculturalism in Russia and his desire to distance himself from it doesn't help either. Um, but there was a modus vivendi up until the 1960s when immigration law changed and suddenly no matter where you came from in the world, we were welcome to Canada. So it is the religion of others, the religion that is not the religion of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Christians, that is not, um, uh, that is not uh, Judaism uh, uh, either. Which had these accommodations uh, already. Um, it is. These are completely different religions um, and completely different cultures. And we're talking about multiculturalism. This is the change in society that, that, we're, that we're discussing. Um, cultures, religions that, in the end, uh, seem to have very little in common with those of the majority who are seeing themselves as hosts. To, I think those are the, the, the dynamics that are, that are helpful to. Uh, to look at it, if you look at this movie at who is uh, speaking on the side of accommodations, what you have is yes, the elite on the one hand, uh, within, uh, within Quebec, um, anglophone and francophone, and you have people who um, are not of European origin. 
and this, these issues are submitted uh, under <coughs> religion, and the whole issue of uh, religion itself is often brought back to cultural differences or, 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 or racial uh, discrimination. And so we don't talk about any of it because we, we keep hiding under uh, the, the other issue. So, Paul Tillich uh, suggests that religion is simply your ultimate concerns, whatever your ultimate concerns are. So one of the ultimate concerns that comes through in the film on the part of those who are arguing against accommodation, their ultimate concern is what they call neutrality. Am I fair in saying that? Or, or, so, or we could propose that their ultimate concern as a society that's lived religious oppression, their ultimate concern is freedom from that oppression. And yeah. very tellingly, what Andre, Andre Dois says is the minute you participate in a religion, you are no longer entirely free. First of all, I think that's, you're never entirely free, even if you're not in a religion. Because we live in a society that has parameters, legal parameters. So, I think it's the fear that in some way, shape, or form, their freedom, they will find themselves curtailed in their freedom. That seems to be um, a big concern. So one of Taylor's arguments then has been, at least as I understand it, has been to argue for uh, what he calls a liberal pluralism. Argue for accommodation of whatever can be accommodated within reason uh, on, on religious grounds as well. Because one of the challenges for, for religious communities is that religious communities rarely, if ever, understand religion to be individualistic. Yes. Private. I mean, that's not a religious category to speak of. Religions are, and certainly for Islam, and for Judaism, and for much of Christianity, that's simply not the way in which religion is understood. It's understood to be illuminating relationships and, and lived out in that world. Try to, try to sell the private religious notion to first peoples in Canada. See how far you get. Um, not on that topic, but just going back to the film, there was a lot about that the extremists were the, the problem. Um, now, if there was no religion, there would be no extremists. So would the people not wanting to accommodate the people do so because they would think it would reduce religion, thus reducing extremists? Well, that's a standard argument, but I think it's, a, it's an absurd argument in light of the 20th century. The 20th century has not been the century of religious wars. It's been the century in which we have created rivers of blood by regimes that were intentionally and ideologically against religion. That is deeply, deeply opposed to religion. So uh, the 20th century is, is about extremist secularism. Yeah, secularism, left to its own devices, becomes a religion, i.e. by uh, following up on what Professor Goa said. It, secularism as an ideology proposes to me ultimate, to answer ultimate questions. That's the functional definition of religion. There's no worship of anything, though. Well, in a Stalinist state, or in North Korea, Sure, looks like the cult of the person. <laughs> well, yeah, they just created a religion where they're being worshipped. And the cult of the idea. But the, in Canada, it's not. The secularism here is right. not no. Stephen Harper being worshipped. Yeah, you know, according to most people. Fair enough. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> some of us wish we did, you know. <laughs> you know the secularism in Canada is not of one person being worshipped. It's of everyone having the same rights and right. of eliminating that. It's not your Sorry. It's not your Let me jump in and suggest that there's there are two kinds of secularism. There's the kind that uh, seeks to uh, create a public space that's welcoming and open for everyone to engage fully as citizens. And there's a kind of secularism that is simply the, the refusal of, of religion. Yeah, that's um, that's and laicity. Right. Yeah. And this this review this refusal refusal of religion um, is in a way. Um, exactly what 
uh, Bouchard and, and Maitre Bon Quebec accused multiculturalism of being. Um, mm -hmm. In the report, uh, Taylor and Bouchard write that Quebec must avoid multiculturalism, which, by not having a culture of reference, presents the future of multi ethnicity as so many just the most separate groups perceived as individual islands. So all these groups, these communities that have nothing to do with each other, that's what's the dangerous with, with multiculturalism. It doesn't see that there is a culture of reference whether you want to or not. So there is the English Canadian culture and the Quebec culture. So let's start with that and let's not pretend it's not there. That's a big criticism of multiculturalism. Mm -hmm. But then you have to be able to see the same thing about secularism as well. Is your secularism open to uh, the, uh, the views and the opinions and the values of others? Or is it simply denying the fact that's coming from your own values and that your refusal of other values? It's, uh, it's uh, one of the uh, uh, main, uh, uh, main characters of the film, uh, uh, her, her, uh, her question when she asks um, uh, a journalist if, uh, a journalist or, or, or someone or another anyway, um, uh, if she is free to not be an atheist. So is it a, an atheist secularism that rejects all, all kinds of religious values, or is that an agnostic form of secularism that doesn't pretend to have the truth, a truth that religions do not have? I, I heard a, a, a wonderful talk about a year ago from a Muslim from uh, Azerbaijan who talked about, was it Azerbaijan? Turkestan, I think. In the, in the Soviet period, talked about how in the schools, or when, when that part of the world became, fell under the umbrella of Uncle Joe Stalin, he leveled all the mosques, they went around and tried to collect all the Korans and destroy them. You were not allowed to appear with any religious garments on, you were not allowed to be in a posture of prayer, uh, anything of that nature. So, and in the school, to counter this, they had to stand up every morning with a nice photograph icon, I would call it, Uncle Joe Stalin, and they had to say, there is no God, that was the creed. There is no God. Which is the exact opposite of the Muslim perfect. So here's what happened. He said, we would do that as little children. We would stand up in school in the morning and say, there is no God. Uh, and then we would do our studies. And then we would go home. And as we stepped across the threshold at home, we would say, but God and Muhammad is the prophet. Because that phrase is the first phrase of the creedal prayer of Islam. There is no God but God, <laughs> not Stalin. And Muhammad is the prophet of God. But does this, I'm sorry, I sort of didn't really let you get your question up fully. Um, well, it was more, it wasn't, you mentioned that it, there's no wars in the 20th century. Well, that's not really what it was referring to. In the film, it said that pamphlet that they put out was that they didn't want stoning in their streets and right. acid on people. Right. That's the type of extremists I'm talking course, about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and reducing that. If I say, if I make a law that you're not allowed to stab someone with a sword, you know, that no one's going to think anything of it. But I, when I say no one's allowed to stone someone because of a Muslim law, now we have media all over it because that's as what how did they put it in there I actually wrote it down um, being um, offensive to the Muslim religion but that's because it's reducing the Muslim religion to that because those laws already exist I mean you couldn't before that before before the the good people of the town promulgated that you couldn't stone people to death in the street you couldn't throw acid in their faith this would be against Quebec law you so why well. did they do it? The issue is why did they do it? What's it about? It's not about the issue. It's about massifying Muslims. It's it's about identifying and and, and putting your fingers up the nose of Muslims, don't you think? Uh, perhaps, but would it also be about preventing? You know, just part of the, from what I understand of Sharia, uh, Sharia, Sharia, sorry, Sharia courts is that they could allow that. Sharia courts don't allow that. That's nonsense. It's not part of the, the issue of the stoning of people for certain 
for certain acts within there are a number of systems of Sharia law. Mm -hmm. So you can you can ferret that out of Sharia law in a couple of cases if you wish, and of course they've done that under Wahhabism in, in Saudi Arabia. And that's of course in the news, so that is part of what people fear. But you couldn't do it in Canada if you had Sharia law. Because in Canada that kind of reads the criminal code. So it wasn't about that. It is a response of fear, I think. I think you've identified that, and I agree with you. It is a response of fear. But it also has the effect of reducing Islam to stoning and throwing acid in people's face. And think for a moment of what the effect of that is on Muslims. In, in Canada, and particularly on Muslim young people who see in the news that that's the way they're depicted. What's the effect? Perhaps to, uh, to answer it, but he's not here, the concerns of, uh, of uh, one of the... Uh, uh, is it the one from... Oh, the one yeah. Yeah, from uh, Enovid. Um, given the laws in Canada, the likelihood of someone who walks around desiring to stone or throw acid at women, um, there's a lot of that they don't want to come together. It's illegal. They're not going to ask them to become illegal. They know it won't work. And so they are more likely to stay in whatever country does, allow it, or turn a blind eye to it, because that's mostly <coughs> what seems to be the, the, the case. Whereas people who are drawn to Canada tend to be those who seek um, uh, a community that um, basically respects the basic rights that we find in our charter. And often we come here because of the, of the charter. But there is an issue, so, female circumcision. You know, female circumcision does take place within Muslim, within some communities here. Now, female circumcision isn't Islamic, but it is associated with particular tribal uh, forms in parts of the world where, where Islam is the dominant religion. And there are people from those parts of the world who've made their home here and who take their children from here, their girl children, out of the country for that act. But they have to take them out of the country for it. And this gets us back to that relation, that dynamic relationship between religion and culture. Islam does not exist in a vacuum, nor does Catholicism or any other relation, any other religion. They always are informed by their culture. <clears throat> I'll give you a, a perfect example that has struck me uh, at just being here in Camrose. You have a beautiful little church above a lake, a uh, mirror lake. Now, that church, as I understand it, uh, what's the name of the church? It's Ukrainian Catholic Church. Yeah. That, that it used to be Bethel Lutheran Church. Be Bethel Lutheran. And then so so it, it began, it begins as a Lutheran church, but I presume... Swedish. Not just <laughs> exactly, and what, and then, then I presume because of immigration or that there were Ukrainian Catholics, they added on the spirals. Well, that's the exact example of culture. Your church there, the Ukrainian Catholic Church on Mirror Lake, exemplifies cultural hybridity. How religion and culture go hand in hand. They've physically altered that structure to reflect another culture. So culture always informs religion. Religion doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's shaped by culture, as, as Tillich points us out. Points out. And what fascinates me about Canada as a religious studies scholar is David, uh, Professor Gove has pointed out, this is a very young country. In actual fact, Canada is a work in progress. We are continuing to negotiate the different cultures and religions. We're a work in progress. I mention this to, to tie it in with what Professor Menonso pointed out. You know, we, we have to define our terms here. When we talk about laïcité, or in English, laicism, this, had, this is not secularism. Laïcité, or laicism, refers to the French Revolution, the whole tradition of French republicanism, the revolution in 1789 
which, as he has rightly pointed out, it's not a matter of we're going to accommodate, we're going to welcome religions, we're shoving religion out of the public domain. It has no place in the public domain whatsoever. That is laicism. That's not secularism. They make no accommodation whatsoever for religion in the public domain. And when, when this film premiered in Paris, in France, it was a packed room, packed with people holding PhDs, doctorates, and from all disciplines. They saw this film and they said, Mon Dieu, my God, we could never have this discussion in France. Because in France, you're dealing with century, a centuries-old tradition that has banished religion from the state, from the public domain, and that's why there's such a visceral reaction to women walking the boulevards of Paris in a burqa. When I was there, they began to apply the law that they had just passed, and they arrested a woman for walking in Paris openly wearing a burqa. And she was fined and she was jailed. In a post-modern world, ladies and gentlemen, are we going to dictate to women how they can dress? Are we going to penalize, indeed criminalize them? So, and, and two weeks ago, in March 11th, we, did, we showed this film <coughs> at another university with a panel of scholars from Europe. Whether it be Italy, whether it be France or elsewhere, they all said this debate could not even happen in, in Italy or in France. There is not that kind of openness. Italy has had, under the Risorgimento, they've had a, a very uneasy relationship. <coughs> the Pope was considered a prisoner of the Vatican until the Concordat, I might add, with Mussolini. <coughs> so, I, I want to reference here a, a seminal work that came out in the 30s by a Belgian scholar, which I think is, is, is helpful in a way to remember that this debate goes back quite a while. Henri Piren wrote a book called uh, The Cross, in English it's uh, translated as The Cross and the Crescent. And what he points out is the track record between Islam and Christianity goes right back to the Middle Ages. And it's been no love lost. And you see that when you're in Europe. There, is, there are centuries-old animosities between Christianity and Islam. And centuries-old decent relationships in some parts. It varies. It's a complex story. I'd like to invite some more questions for the students first. You know? It should come at no surprise, though, that religion has been causing war for centuries. I mean, why is it now that people are bringing it up and freaking out and being oh my god, she's wearing this, we should make her take it off. It's, it seems stupid, sorry, for lack of a better word. She wants to wear it, let her wear it. That's like me walking in and saying, oh my god, she's wearing a red jacket, it must have some type of tie to style, and let's make her take it off. <laughs> you know, it's, if she wants to wear it, let her wear it. It doesn't affect anybody else, it shouldn't affect anybody else. I would very much like to hear all the ladies in this room. How would you feel about a law that says you cannot wear certain clothing? How do you feel about being asked this question first? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I, I definitely agree with what you said. I think it's uh, redundant because I mean, racism in general has been a big issue over centuries. So for for this issue just to so to specifically be on a logo that, like, you can't, it's like we're putting them all in a bunch and assuming that they are all acting the same and then when they don't, everybody's different. We can't judge a person, mm -hmm. we're judging them as a group, but that's to say, like, we can't, we can't just judge you professors for being white males, right? Ah, touche, you got us. <laughs> just, based on, just based on that. So we can't judge women based on their clothing. And I think they brought that up because there's a bunch of stereotypes that go with um, the burqa and what they wear. We just assume that they're submission to the submission to the religion or to men. And and the young lady next to you, how do you feel about the idea of passing a law? I think that my voice is kind of gone, but my mom, I, I'm from a Muslim family, and my mom actually wears the hijab, and so 
she didn't always wear it, and she started probably when I was 10, but I couldn't imagine her not wearing it now. It's so part of who she is as a person. It's not really just a religious thing anymore. It's just kind of what defines her as a person as well. So if someone took that away from her, I would, you know, would really take away from the person she is. That's a wonderful comment. And the young lady right here? How would you feel about passing a law that determines what you can wear and what you cannot wear? I think it's kind of realistic. I mean, we don't have the same level of those same laws for men, so why should we have it for women? <laughs> why should we have certain laws that dictate what it means to be a woman when in reality we still don't have those for men? We're on a two-way street here, and mm -hmm. if men want to wear turbans, no one's freaking out there. I mean, I'm sure they do in some areas, but it's not a main issue in the sense that the veil is. It's actually a very um, important drama person to the issue because there have been uh, there has been a huge accommodation for for turbans in the RCMP. Yeah. And, the fact and it was not without controversy no. at the beginning, no. <laughs> but it happened. Yeah. Right, and so. Maybe there's a bit more willingness on, on that side to accommodate men than, than there are other women. Yeah, that's a very good point. But it happened, for, it happened for a couple of reasons. This has to do with the Sikh turban yes. and the RCMP. It happened for a couple of reasons, not the least of which is you had developed in the Sikh community in Canada, obviously in India, and in Canada a whole movement of aspiration to establish Khalistan, to establish their own home state in the Punjab. And a number of people in Canadian Gurudwaras and Canadian Sikh temples, uh, some people got on board with that movement, and some of them took very radical action. I mean, they blew up a plane, for example. So the RCMP needed to have devout Sikhs in order to understand what was going on in the community. You couldn't have secularized Sikhs, mm -hmm. because secularized Sikhs don't have the profile within the community. So here's an example of the state having a need for people who are religiously devout, even though they're committed to the state. So it's a, it's a curious kind of two-way street in the case of the, the Sikh turban being accommodated by the National Police Force and security services. And, and how do you feel about the law? I think it should be up to your own, your own choice, your own decision. And we should be understanding and respect that. And I mean, they don't make a big deal if women are wearing barely no clothing. But they do if you have a, a half on. It's so, interesting, huh? Yeah. yeah. And I have to do some about our society. Yeah, exactly. And I've had the privilege of working in North Africa, both in Algeria and in Tunisia. And when you're in Tunisia, for example, they have these club meds, these private, where all the Europeans, the Brits come down, the Germans come down, the Scandinavians come down, and they wear bikinis. And then they get on the bus to go back to their hotel. Not just the men, but the women cannot believe that civilized people dress and conduct themselves like that. And, and you see very clearly that we're working with different worldviews, and they're expressed by the way we dress. In an Islamic world, for people to go around like that, it simply doesn't make sense. They don't understand how, how civilized people could run around like that. Ma'am, ma how did you, how would you think? She's still, uh, sorry. I, I think it's appalling that, that there is anybody dictating what people can wear. Mm -hmm. um, be it the kirpan or the hijab. But I also think that maybe, and on a lighter note, perhaps the problem with the, the hijabs and the veil, I wonder if somebody shouldn't maybe look at the fashion industry in Quebec and see if they're not behind that a little bit. <laughs> it's losing people money. <laughs> Very, I never thought of that. They can get on to the hijab issue. There's one last lady in the room. How would you feel about a law passed that determines what women can wear? I think the other women in the room have summed up my exact feelings on it as well. Though I would argue that 
right now, even though there's not a law, there are measures of social control that do dictate what women should wear, could wear, can wear, and there are consequences that follow how a person dresses. So for it to be made into law would just allow for penalizing the woman based on her religious or um, oriented background. Let's make it a little more complex. The woman is a judge. <clears throat> Does this, does the woman has to working, wear a robe. Uh, working, working in a civil, a civil position, <laughs> and she wears hijab. What happens then? Is that something that would concern you? I don't Is that an issue? Big problem. So she's wearing one. You don't think it's a big problem? Hot? Should she take it off? Is it too uh -huh. If she wants to wear it, let her wear it. So part That's of what we've been saying, although Canadian law says that it shouldn't be in the courts, yes, keep it out, whatever. If she wants to wear it, just let her wear it. Now I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Um, in January, I led a dialogic series with a justice of the Superior Court of Ontario, and this was right after the Supreme Court made its decision regarding where, whether Muslim women can remain veiled when they give their testimony. And you might recall that Beverly McClellan, uh, who is the head, is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, she is known for bringing consensus to the bench, bringing um, really unity to the bench. The resulting decision on this issue was the most split Supreme Court under Beverly McClellan. This really divided the justices. And if you read some of the articles that were published, judges go a lot during testimony, during trial, by the facial expressions, trying to ascertain the credibility of the witness. And this split the Supreme Court of Canada. And when, when Justice James Clark was my guest, he has now... He's just re he's retired from the bench, and now he can write about some of these issues. And there is no if ands and buts about it. Body language and facial expressions play a major role in the courtroom. It really is high drama in that sense in the courtroom. So it's body language in, in some of these cases, but the another issue. I mean, this is from the the court's perspective, the notion of the neutrality of the court. Part of the argument, and this argument is was in the Taylor Bouchard report as well, and Charles Taylor's written about it. Uh, let me just use another example. You have a judge on the bench who's Jewish, so he wears a yarmulke, uh, head covered. And the court case has to do with the Palestinian. So now one would assume the judge will be neutral, as the judge is supposed to be, and listen carefully. One can assume that. But there's a question of appearance. In the Canadian judicial system and in our legal system, there's also the matter of, and this is kind of a cautionary thing, wanting to be sure that the person who is brought before the bench has a sense that they will get a fair hearing. Mm -hmm. And is there an argument that that wouldn't, <coughs> wouldn't be there? So how do you respond you to that? Because yeah. I see Native people go to court right. all the time, and who's racist to Native people? I'm sorry, but the white male is. And who is sitting there in the bench? Right. The white male. And who's sitting there being prosecuted? A First Nations person. There's no issues that come up about that. <coughs> if that seem no, is normal, if that seem is normal, if that seem is okay, then yeah, I don't see a problem with that at all. Would you like to see that change? Do you think it would be beneficial? If in fact we had far more judges on the bench, I would like to think that if they've gone entire life being a lawyer and seeing what's just, that by the time that they have their seat as a judge, they will no longer be this racial type of person. They will have surpassed all this type of attitude above us. Do you think that's the case? I think it should be. It should be. Yeah. 
So I'd like to really invoke my powers as moderator and also the professor of this class to <laughs> dismiss you. Uh, but first, to, to thank you for your participation yes. and to thank our guests here for, for uh, doing this discussion. So if you please join me in thanking them. Distinguished visiting fellow of the Ronin Center for the Study of Religion, I would personally like to thank Professor Menonçon for make, for accommodating this session, and uh, Professor David Goa, the director of the center, who extended the invitation. And um, if that piece of paper is floating around, I'd love to keep in contact with you folks. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank you.